Music. My family is very musical. My father plays the guitar. He plays in a band. The band plays country music. My mother is a singer in the band. She also plays the piano. I took the flute in music class at school. I play the flute in the school band. I also sing in the school choir. I have a low voice. My sister has a high voice. She is a soprano. At home, I like to practice the drums, but my mother says that it's too loud. Sometimes I play so loudly that I break a drumstick. I practice whenever she goes out. I would like to be in a rock band. Some of my friends and I are thinking of starting our own rock band. My sister is a very good piano player. She has won many awards at music festivals. She likes to play classical music, but sometimes I get her to play rock music with me. She is also a very good singer. I like to sing with her. We sing in harmony. I listen to music all the time on the radio. I know a lot of songs. I can sing along with most of the songs that come on the radio. I memorize the lyrics of the songs. My sister and I sometimes get together and sing our favorite songs. Maybe someday we will start our own rock band, and I will be the drummer. Spring. It rains a lot in the spring. The trees are full of buds, and the flowers are starting to bloom. My favorite spring flowers are tulips and daffodils. The birds come back from the south. I can always tell that spring is here when I see my first robin of the season. The robins pull worms from the wet ground. When it isn't raining, my friends and I go outside and toss a ball around. We look forward to the summer, but we are glad to get outside after the long winter. The air smells so fresh in the spring. My mother always tells me not to track mud into the house. It's very muddy in our yard in the springtime. I wipe my muddy feet before I go into the house. There are a lot of puddles in my yard. I sometimes splash in the puddles, and I get wet and cold, so I have to go into the house. I like it when the snow has melted, the rain has stopped, and the sun comes out. On sunny days, I always get together with my friends. On those days, we either ride our bikes. Or play ball. My parents like to go for walks on spring evenings. They also like to clean up the yard in the spring. Everyone seems to be outside. The springtime brings people out of their houses. The birthday party. Yesterday, I went to a birthday party. My friend Jane had her tenth birthday. Her house was decorated with balloons and streamers. Her mother had baked a big birthday cake. The cake had "Happy Tenth Birthday, Jane" written on it. There were ten candles on the cake. Jane blew out the candles and made a wish. I wonder what she wished for. Your wish won't come true if you tell anyone what it was. We sang "Happy Birthday to You." At the party, we played some games. I won one of the games, so I got a prize. We also swam in Jane's swimming pool. Jane opened her gifts. Her gifts were wrapped in bright paper and bows. She got lots of nice gifts. She got some compact discs, some clothes, and some computer games. Jane thanked everyone. We ate a lot of food at Jane's party. We had hot dogs. I put mustard and ketchup on my hot dog. Then we ate cake and ice cream. We had pop to drink. I think I had too much cake and ice cream. I was very full by the time the party was over. We thanked Jane and her mother before we all went home. It was a very good party. Everyone had a good time. I hope Jane had a happy tenth birthday.
My classroom. My classroom is a large room. It's full of brightly colored pictures. My teacher hangs pictures up all over the walls. There are blackboards at the front of the room. My teacher always has writing all over the blackboards. Sometimes the chalk squeaks when she writes on the blackboard. We cover our ears when that happens. Our classroom is full of desks. There are a lot of students in our class. Our desks are full of books, notebooks, and pens. I try to keep my desk neat, but I have a lot of things in there. My ruler and pencils are always falling out of my desk. At the back of the room is a bookcase full of books. We can sign those books out and take them home to read. I have read a lot of the books. I like mysteries and biographies, so I have taken many of those home. There are also tables at the back of the room. That's where we do our artwork. We spread out big sheets of paper and use paints or crayons to make pictures. Sometimes we cut things out of magazines with scissors and we glue pictures to the paper. I like art class. After school, my friends and I often erase the blackboards for the teacher. Then we take the erasers outside and clap them together to get the chalk dust out of them. My friends and I walk home together and talk about what we did in school and what we're going to do after supper. Vacation. My family and I went on vacation to Lake Huron. The water is beautiful and blue there, and the sand is nice and white. The week that we were there was very hot. The sun was hot, but the water was still very cold. I went swimming and tried to catch little fish in my hands. I was careful not to get sunburned. We stayed at a hotel that had a pool and a game room. I played pinball and video games sometimes. I like to swim in the hotel pool, but I like the beach better. I would lie on a big beach towel and get warm. Then I would jump in the water and cool off. Sometimes I would just lie on the sand and watch the waves roll up on shore. I found some seashells and saw a crab walking on the sand. At first, I was a bit lonely because I didn't know anyone there. It wasn't long before I met some other kids my age. We built sandcastles together and swam in the lake. The other kids were from different towns, so we told each other stories about our schools and friends. We found that we had a lot in common, even though we were from different places. Our families got together and went to restaurants together. We played volleyball on the beach and we sat around a campfire at night and sang songs. At the campfire, we would roast marshmallows on a stick. I always burn my marshmallows. That is okay. I like them that way. Mostly, we just swam in the lake until we were very tired. I was sorry when our vacation was over. I had a good time at Lake Huron. I met some very good friends there. We still write to each other. Maybe we'll see each other next summer. My house. I live in a two-story house. The bottom of the house is painted white. The upper part of the house is made of red brick. The chimney is also made of red brick. If you go through the front door and turn right, you'll see the living room. The living room is very large and comfortable. There are easy chairs, a coffee table, and a sofa in there. I like to sit in there and relax. Next to the living room is the dining room. There are a dining table and chairs in there. We use this room whenever we have visitors over for dinner. Beside the dining room is the kitchen. The kitchen has a stove and a refrigerator in it. There's also a kitchen table with some benches at it. Most of the time, we eat in the kitchen. Upstairs, there are three bedrooms. My parents' bedroom is very big. They have a large queen-sized bed in there, and there are two closets for their clothes. My room is smaller. My room is painted pink, and I have ruffled curtains on the windows. From my bedroom window, you can see the front yard. There's a pine tree in the front yard. My brother's bedroom is painted blue. He has blinds on the windows. He has a bunk bed in his room. If he has a friend stay over, one of them can sleep on the top bunk, 
and the other can sleep on the bottom bunk. You can see the backyard from his bedroom window. There are rose bushes and a picnic table in the backyard. There is also a white fence that has a gate in it. In the basement, there is a recreation room. This is where we watch television and have friends over to visit. The laundry room is also in the basement. There's a washing machine and a dryer in there. Beside our house is a garage. We keep the car in the garage whenever the weather is bad. Our house is just the right size for our family. Friends are always welcome at our house. My family. My grandparents are coming to visit us from Calgary, Alberta. My father is very happy because they are his parents, and he's glad that he will see them. We don't see them very often because Calgary is a long way from Toronto. My grandparents have two sons: my father and my uncle Bill. Uncle Bill is married to my aunt Susan. They have a daughter who is my cousin. My cousin is a lot older than I, so we do not have a lot in common. They also have a son who is the same age as me. He is my favorite cousin because we both like the same television shows and the same games. I have two brothers and one sister. My brothers are both younger than I. They are twins, so they have the same birthday. My sister is one year older than I. People say that my sister and I look alike. We both have blonde hair and blue eyes. My mother's parents live near us. They are my grandmother and grandfather who visit us often. My mother does not have any brothers or sisters. She is an only child. I like it when all my family is together. I don't have a lot of cousins like some people do, but I have fun with my relatives. My uncle will often take my cousin and me to the movies. I like to take my grandparents for walks so they can see my school and they can meet my friends. My parents talk to my brothers and my sister and I a lot. We are a very close knit family. People who have close families are very lucky. Winter. Once the fall is over and the snowflakes start to fall, I get very excited. I can hardly wait for the ground to be covered with a blanket of white snow. I put on my mittens, my scarf, my hat, coat, and winter boots, and I run out into the fluffy snow. I have to be careful not to slip on the ice. It can get very icy and cold in the winter. The first thing that I do. Is to build a snowman. I sometimes build a snow fort too. My friends and I have a good snowball fight. We laugh a lot, and our cheeks and noses get very red. When we get too cold, we go into the house and have a cup of hot chocolate. My father fills the backyard with water that freezes and turns into an ice rink. When the ice is hard enough, my friends and I get our skates and we go out on the ice to play hockey. All of my friends own hockey sticks. I am usually the goalie, and I have to keep the puck from going into the net. My sister and her friends don't really like to play hockey; they would rather just skate around on the ice. I took skating lessons, so I don't usually fall down. My little brother is just learning to skate, so he falls down a lot. My father has to shovel the snow off the paths and the driveway in the winter. I help him. Shoveling snow is hard work. When my dad and I finish shoveling the driveway, we go into the house and warm our hands and feet in front of the fireplace. There is probably nothing more beautiful than fresh fallen snow on the trees. In the morning, when the sun shines on the snow, it glistens. I like to leave my footprints in the snow. Winter can be very beautiful and exciting. Autumn. Some people call autumn the fall. You can call it either one. Autumn is the time when the leaves change color. They change from green to beautiful shades of gold, orange, and red. It looks like an artist has come along and painted all the trees. The air starts to get a little colder in the autumn. We begin to wear jackets or sweaters. We go back to school in the autumn. The teacher sometimes gets us to make leaf collections. 
we collect different types of leaves and make a display of them. Autumn is the time when old friends get back together and talk about what they did on their summer vacations. Halloween comes in the autumn. We dress up in costumes. Some of them are scary and some of them are funny. We go from door to door and say "trick or treat," and people give us candies. We wear masks on our faces, and we have a lot of fun. The autumn winds start to blow. The wind blows the leaves right off the trees until the trees have bare branches. My friends and I have a lot of fun outside before the winter leaves us shivering. We play football and soccer at school. After school, we ride our bikes through the piles of dry leaves. The leaves go flying through the air as we drive through them. My parents rake the leaves up and put them in a big pile. I like to jump in the big piles of leaves, but then my parents just have to rake them up again. The skies get a little cloudier in the autumn, and we know that soon there will be snow. So we enjoy the brisk autumn weather while we can. Summer. Yahoo! School is over. We are free for the summer. My friends and I run out on the last day of school into the bright summer sun. We sing a song about no more pencils and no more books. We can hardly wait to do all the summer things that we like to do. We go swimming. We play baseball. We ride our bikes and we go to the beach. We go on vacations, or some of us go to summer camp. It is just nice to run barefoot through the grass, or lie on your back and look up at the clouds. Summer days are lazy days. We don't have to do schoolwork. We listen to the buzzing of the bees. We watch the birds as they fly from tree to tree. We go down to the pond and toss rocks into the water. We eat ice cream and we have barbecues. Some of my friends' parents have boats, so we go for rides in their boats. Some of my friends go to their cottages. They have cottages on lakes. Some of my friends even have summer jobs. My best friend works at a supermarket. My father pays me to do jobs for him. I cut the grass, take out the garbage, and wash the car. I like to be outside in the sunshine. On Sundays, my mother will pack a picnic lunch, and we go down to the park. Sometimes we play baseball. There is also a tennis court at the park. I'm a very good tennis player. My sister just likes to swing on the swings and slide down the slide. We eat our sandwiches and watch out for the ants that always seem to be at picnics. After we have our lunch, my sister and I run off to play with the other children. My dad has a nap, and my mother reads her book. My skin gets brown from the sun in the summer. Summer is my favorite season. I like the sounds, smells, and feelings that come with the summer sun. Summer is a lot of fun. I wish summer could go on forever. The doctor. I didn't feel very well last week. I had a sore throat and a fever. My mother took me to see the doctor. When we got there, the nurse took my name and said that the doctor would be with me soon. The doctor was a very nice man in a white jacket. I had seen the doctor before when I had my tonsils out at the hospital. The doctor took a light and looked in my ears. He put a stick on my tongue and he shone his light into my mouth. He looked at my throat. He said that my throat was a bit swollen and red. He felt my neck and said my glands were swollen. He took my temperature and said that it was quite high. He listened to my heart. And he made me cough. He asked me some questions. He said he might have to do some tests. He sent me to get some blood taken out of my arm. I was scared, but it didn't really hurt. The doctor gave me some pills and told me to take one in the morning and one at night. He told me to drink lots of fluids. He told me to get plenty of sleep. I did exactly what the doctor told me to do. It wasn't very long before I was feeling well again. I think that I might like to be a doctor when I grow up. I would like to make people feel better. The dentist. My friend's father is a dentist. He has an office near my house. I went to see him on Thursday. His nurse told me to sit in a very big chair. 
she tied a bib under my chin. The dentist came in. He examined my teeth with some shiny silver tools. He looked at my front teeth and my back teeth. He told me that the back teeth were called molars. He told me to open wide. He had a little mirror that he used to look at my teeth. He said that I had good, strong teeth. He told me that I didn't have any cavities. I told him that I didn't eat a lot of candies and that I always brush my teeth after every meal. He said that was very good. He asked me if I flossed my teeth, and I said yes. I use dental floss every day. He told me that my teeth were healthy because I took very good care of them. He left and told me to keep up the good work. The dental hygienist came in, and she said that she would clean my teeth for me. She scraped my teeth with a sharp tool, and then she put some polish on my teeth and began to clean them. When she was done, she told me to spit into a bowl, and then I rinsed my mouth out with water. I looked into a mirror and saw that my teeth were very shiny and white. If I take care of my teeth, I'll have them forever. I would like to keep my teeth healthy and white. I like to smile. The school play. We are putting on a play at school. Some of the students are actors in the play. Some people are building the sets. Some people will sew costumes, and some people will be makeup artists. The teacher is the director of the play. The play will be held on a big stage in the gymnasium. The curtains will open, the lights will go on, and the play will begin. It will be very exciting. All of our families will come to see the play. They will clap when the play is over. My friend is very good at cutting wood and building things. He's helping to build the set. My other friend, Michael, is an artist, so he is painting the set so that it looks like a forest. My friend Marie likes to put makeup on people, so she is a makeup artist. She will put makeup on me so that I will look like an old woman. Some of the mothers help to sew the costumes. The play is called Hansel and Gretel. I will play the part of the witch. The boy who plays Hansel has to wear shorts and a shirt. I wear a witch's hat and a black dress. I also carry a broom. Some of the people in my class will be dressed like trees and flowers. This is a musical play, and the trees and flowers will sing to Hansel and Gretel as they walk through the forest. I can hardly wait for opening night. I want my family and friends to see me acting on stage. I hope they will like the play. We have all learned our lines and worked very hard at making this play a success. Emotions. Do you ever think about your emotions? What kinds of things make you sad? I get sad when I get a bad mark in school or when someone that I like moves away. I sometimes see sad movies that make me cry. I don't like to be sad. I don't like to have a frown on my face. I like to be happy. I'm happy most of the time. Parties make me happy. Being with my friends makes me happy. Lots of things make me happy. If someone tells me a joke, I laugh. I enjoy laughing. Funny movies make me laugh. I think that people look the best when they smile. What kinds of things make you mad? I get mad when my brother breaks one of my toys. I try not to show it when I get mad. My parents get mad at me if I come home late. I don't think anger is a good emotion. It is best to stay calm and talk things over. Emotions come from inside you, but they show on your face. People can tell when you're mad or sad or happy. I prefer to look happy. Sometimes I even smile when I'm feeling sad, and the smile makes me feel a little better. My first job. I just got a job at the grocery store. This is my first job. I will receive a paycheck every two weeks. I wear a uniform. The uniform has the name of the grocery store on it. I have many jobs at the grocery store. I have to collect all the carts from the parking lot and bring them back into the store. I have to put all the produce out for the people to see. I will be putting out the vegetables. There are carrots, lettuce, cabbages. 
cucumbers, and beans to put out this morning. I also have to put the fruit out on the stand so that it looks nice. The oranges roll away when I put them out, so I have to be careful. I put out the apples, bananas, and grapes. I stack boxes up so that people can buy cereal and cookies. I have to be careful, or the boxes will fall. There are cans of things which also need to be placed on the shelves. The lie. Yesterday, I told a lie. I don't feel very good about it. I was bouncing a ball in the kitchen, and the ball bounced up and broke a cup. It was one of my mother's best cups, so I was afraid that she would be mad. I put the broken cup back on the table, and I didn't tell anyone that I had broken it. That night, my mother asked who had broken the cup. My brother said, "Not me." My sister said, "I didn't do it." I said, "I didn't break the cup," but I was lying. My mother said that we would all be punished if someone didn't tell the truth and say who broke the cup. I still did not tell her that I had broken it. She gave us one more chance, and she said she wasn't mad about the cup. She just wanted us to be honest. I still didn't say anything. My brother, sister, and I all got sent to our rooms. We had to stay in our rooms all morning. My brother said it wasn't fair. I felt very bad because my brother and sister were being punished because of me. I went to my mother and told her that I had broken the cup. She said that she was not upset about the broken cup. She knew that it was an accident. She was disappointed in me because I hadn't come forward and told the truth. She said that she wouldn't have punished me if I had been honest with her. I told my brother and sister that I was sorry. I felt bad because they were punished because I was dishonest. I told my mother that I was sorry that I had lied to her. I told her that I had learned a lesson. Honesty is the best policy. It is better to tell the truth. It is not a good feeling when people don't trust you. I have learned that lying just hurts people. Sometimes it is hard to be honest, but it is the best way to be. Hobbies. A lot of people have hobbies. Hobbies are interesting things that people like to do in their spare time. My father has a hobby. He has a model railroad set that he put together. A tiny electric train runs through make-believe villages and travels through tunnels and over mountains. My father also enjoys sailing. He has a real sailboat that he takes us out on. He is teaching me how to sail. I like to collect things. I collect comic books, stamps, and coins. I trade comic books with some of my friends, and sometimes I buy comic books at stores. Some of the very old comic books are worth a lot of money. I have stamps from all over the world. Whenever any of my friends get a letter from a faraway place, they save the stamps for me. I have stamps from England, Japan, Australia, and even Russia. I use a magnifying glass to look at the stamps, and I keep them in a special album. I don't have too many coins yet, but I have a very old dime from Canada, and I have a coin with a hole in it from Africa. My mother used to collect dolls when she was a little girl. The dolls wore costumes from different countries. My friend John's hobby is painting. He does oil painting. He has even sold some of his paintings. He is a good artist. My friend Linda sews. She has made clothes for herself and some of her friends. Maybe Linda will be a fashion designer when she gets older. Sometimes people's hobbies lead them into their careers. Christmas. In December, Christmas comes. We get a holiday from school, and our parents get a few days off from work. Our family gets ready for Christmas by decorating the house. We decorate inside and out. On the outside of the house, we put up lights that twinkle and glow. We have a wooden Santa Claus and a reindeer set that my father puts up on the roof. Inside, we put up a Christmas tree. Some years, we have a real tree. Real pine trees smell nice, but you have to be careful that they don't dry out and start a fire. This year, we have an artificial tree. We hang tinsel and ornaments on the tree. We also hang strands of light on the tree and put a star at the top.
Everyone thinks that the tree is beautiful when we turn on the lights. We place gifts under the tree. There is a gift for me under the tree. It is wrapped in red paper and it has a big green bow on it. Red and green are the Christmas colors. On Christmas Eve, my brother and sister and I will hang our stockings near the fireplace. Santa Claus comes down the chimney and fills our stockings full of toys and goodies. On Christmas morning, it is exciting to see what Santa has left for you. My mother will make a big turkey dinner for us on Christmas Day. We have lots of vegetables and good-tasting foods to go with the turkey. We will have dessert too. Some of my family like Christmas pudding, but I will just have ice cream. Last year, some carolers came to the door. It was snowing outside. They stood in the snow and sang Christmas carols to us. My father gave them some money, and my mother gave them some hot chocolate to warm them up. They had lovely voices, and they sang some of my favorite carols. We also collect food. Gifts and money for some of the people in town who cannot afford to have Christmas. My family is collecting things for a poor family who live near here. We had fun deciding which toys to buy for the children in that family. It was a good feeling to share with people who do not have as much as you do. My parents have always taught us that Christmas is a time for giving, not receiving. I think they're right. School dance. It is the first school dance that I have ever been to. All of the boys are standing on one side of the gymnasium, and all of the girls are on the other side. There is loud music playing, and I can hardly hear my friends talking. The music is going fast, and some people are starting to move to the beat of the song. Soon, all the girls are dancing, but the boys are still standing against the wall. Then the song ends, and slow music comes on. I don't know what to do, so I just go and stand against the wall. Then one of the boys in my class comes over and asks me if I would like to dance to the slow song. I really feel awkward and nervous, but say yes. We go out into the middle of the gym, and he puts his hands on my waist, and I put my hands on his shoulders. We start to move to the music, and we step on each other's feet. He is bigger than me, so my toe starts to hurt a little bit. As we continue to slow dance, more boys and girls come to the middle of the gym to dance together. It sure is funny to watch people dance because they are stepping on each other's toes and bumping into each other and turning in opposite directions. Soon the song ends and the boys go to one side of the gym again. The girls decide that they want to dance to a fast song. So they stay in the middle of the gym and dance with one another. Our teachers are making sure that we are behaving because they are watching us. I wonder if they want to dance. They probably are remembering their first school dance. I wonder if someday I'll be grown up, just like the teachers, and laughing at the memories of my first school dance. I sure hope so. Health. Our health is very important to us. People can have good jobs, money, or good looks. However, if they become sick, those things don't mean a thing. It is wonderful to feel good. Feeling good isn't just about our body; it is also about our mind and spirit. We need to feel good in every area of our life. One of the things we can do to be healthy is to get enough sleep. If we don't sleep well, Or enough, it hurts our body. It is during sleep that our body restores itself. Everybody knows we should also eat good foods. We need milk products, meats, fruits, and vegetables, and breads and cereals. We shouldn't eat too much fat or sugar things either. Of course, we just shouldn't eat too much at all. Another thing that is very important is water. Exercise is very good for both our body and mind. It is good for our heart, lungs, muscles, and bones. It gets oxygen to our brain to help us think better. It can help us be smarter. Doing things that we believe are right and good gives us peace inside. It makes us nicer people and is good for our spirit. When we do what we know is right, it helps to reduce stress, which isn't good for any part of us. 
When we take care of our body, mind, and spirit, we feel good all over and inside, too. What a beautiful world this would be if we could all work at doing these things for ourselves and also trying to be a help to others. Halloween Ghosts, goblins, witches, princes and princesses, kings, queens, skeletons. So many of these things are walking down my street. Oh no! They are coming to my door. The doorbell chimes, and I slowly open the door. There, standing on my front porch, is a little ghost and a cute little witch. They hold up a bag and say, Trick or treat! I put candy into their bags, and they smile and say, Thank you! Every October 31st is Halloween. That is when children dress up as different things. Not just funny people, but things like animals or fruits or vegetables. They go from door to door and get different candies or little toys from the people in the houses. Some children, who are not very nice, will do naughty things to houses where people are not home, like throwing eggs at their windows. I think that is bad. Sometimes people decorate their houses for this day. Some of the houses can be pretty scary. They'll have scary noises coming from a tape recorder, too. However, it's only for a few days out of the year, so we may as well have fun with it. This year, my brother is dressing up as a skeleton, and I'm dressing up as a bride. I am wearing my mom's wedding dress. It is fun dressing up in costumes and putting on lots of makeup. Sometimes our friends don't even know who we really are. The best part of Halloween is the candy, of course. I once got an entire garbage bag full of candy. My mom and dad took it away because I was eating too much. Mom gave me a piece of candy every day, though. If you eat too much candy, you can get a stomach ache. You need to remember to brush your teeth often, too, so you don't get cavities. Still, that candy sure does taste good. Well, it's time to go trick or treating, so off I go, door to door, getting yummy candy and hearing people say, Oh, aren't you pretty? New Year's 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. Happy New Year! What is New Year's? Well, to me, a new year is when the date of the year changes. This year it is 2001, and on December 31st at midnight, it will change to 2002. I wonder who invented the changing of the years and how it was made the way it is. It must have been someone a long time ago, since it's already 2001. When New Year's comes closer, a lot of people talk about New Year's resolutions. I don't bother making resolutions because I never do them anyway, and the ones I do make are usually ones that will happen anyway. I guess it's just common sense. The biggest reason why I like New Year's is because of the fireworks that we have here in Canada and many other countries, too. You should see some of the fireworks that go off. There are many different colors. There's pink, blue, purple, yellow, green, red, even white, silver, and gold. Fireworks make loud bangs, squeals, siren sounds, and sometimes all at once. There are lots of different sounds, but I can't even explain what they are all like. Fireworks are best when it's very dark outside. They light up the whole sky. Sometimes they look as though they are going to fall on you. I like New Year's because it's fun in other ways, but the fireworks are the best. You can buy fireworks to use for your own fireworks show. However, you have to be careful that no one gets burned or hurt. Usually there are parties at New Year's. Some people really dress up fancy and even wear masks. They don't know who one another is until midnight when they take their masks off. As midnight comes very close, everybody begins to count down, and then everyone yells out, Happy New Year's! and bangs pots and pans or rings bells or honk horns. Join me in the countdown on New Year's Eve. Ten, nine, eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one. Happy New Year!
More music. I like music. I have always liked music. Even when I was very young, I liked music. I like to listen to it and to make it. When I was a little girl, listening to nice music would sometimes make me cry. That may seem silly, but the music was so pretty that I cried. As I grew older, I started to take piano lessons. I was not very good at first, but after a while, I got better. Also, as I grew older, I started to take violin lessons. I did not sound very good at all at first, but I improved. When I was a teenager in high school, I made sure I had music classes every year. Those were the classes I enjoyed most of all. Everyone loved music, and we had a lot of fun. I started to take private singing lessons while I was in high school too. I also sang in the choir, played in a band, and acted in plays in high school. The plays were all musicals, so I got to sing and dance and enjoy music that way also. It was so much fun pretending to be other people. When I finished high school, I went to university to learn how to be a music teacher. That was a lot of fun because every day I was with other people who loved music as much as I do. Mostly, I played the piano, but I also learned how to play the drums, a saxophone, a trombone, a French horn, a clarinet, a flute, which I really was not very good at, and a viola. I took more singing lessons too. We did not have plays to sing and act in, but I sang in the university choir. Some years, I played the piano for other students who were learning other instruments. One year, I played duets with another girl who was also there to play piano. She and I made sure we played fast, funny songs, so we really enjoyed ourselves doing it. Now I am a music teacher. I do not have a lot of students, not as many as I used to have anyway. I still find it very rewarding. I like to see people who start off not knowing very much, if anything, and go on to be very good at creating music. I still love listening to music. Also, music makes me happy when I am sad. It makes me want to dance or sing when I'm already happy. Mostly, music just makes me glad that I am me and that music is alive in me. Babies. My baby is asleep in my arms. Her soft cheek rests against my chest, while her sweet breath puffs gently on my skin. Her tiny lips are puckered a bit. Her little eyelids flutter. I wonder what she dreams about as she sleeps. Does she dream? I have heard her whimper in her sleep. Sometimes she awakens with a scream. What is so scary in her little baby dreams? Once I heard her giggle as she slept. Her dreams must have been sweet that day. I have had three babies. The one I am holding now is my last one. My other babies are grown up more and now at school. I love their childish play and laughter. I miss their baby dimples and their baby sounds and smells. There is such joy in the birth of a new baby. We hear their first little cry, telling us all is well with their small world. We feel their newborn skin wrinkled, soft, and slightly damp. We feel each little limb and are filled with wonder and humility. Life is good as baby takes its first food from its mother. Family gathers around, each waiting to hold and love this newest member. Each time the baby cries, its mom worries, and their bond becomes stronger. Babies have their own special smell. Some have described it as milk and innocence. It is the sweetest smell on earth, I think. It cannot be copied. Somehow it disappears as baby grows. I love to hear my baby talk. Once in a while, I can even understand a little bit. She is so serious in her baby talk that I just have to pick her up and hug her. I love to hear her say "mummy." When my baby is tickled, or when the dog or her big brothers do something funny, it is so sweet to hear her baby laugh. It's such a cute little giggle. Sometimes she laughs so hard, her face turns red, 
Tears come to her eyes, and she falls down weak with the laughter. Those who watch her can't help but laugh too. I hope she always laughs so easily. The parents watch with pride and joy as baby grows and has many firsts. There is the first time baby sleeps through the night, rolls over, smiles, laughs, hugs and kisses. Then there is the first tooth, crawling, first step and first word. With each new first, the baby becomes less a baby. These steps are a little sad to parents too, because they know they're losing their baby. However, to a mother, even an adult child is still her baby. My baby is not perfect. Sometimes she gets mad or whines for no reason, but to me, she is still beautiful. Her smiles more than make up for her tears. Her hugs wipe away when she's been bad. I intend to cherish each moment with my baby while I can. Bedtime. I am almost nine years old, and my bedtime is eight thirty p.m. I think that is so unfair. I think I am old enough to stay up until at least nine p.m. My parents say that I have to go to bed early because I have school the next day. I can't wait until I am grown up and can stay awake as long as I want. Even though I think I should be able to go to bed later, I do like our nighttime routine. At about eight fifteen p.m., my mom sends us upstairs to put on our pajamas. When we come back downstairs, we read together. Sometimes mom will read to us, and sometimes we will read to her. If dad is not working, he will sometimes read too. Mostly, it is mom we read with, though. When we read, mom helps us with words we cannot read. We have to try and sound the word out. But if we are really stuck, she will help us. If we come to a place in our reading where we do not understand the meaning of what was written, we stop reading and look at mom. She will tell us what it means or help us figure it out on our own. After we are finished reading, we say good night to everyone in the house. First, we say good night to mom and give her a hug and a kiss. Then we do the same for dad, then our little sister, and then our dog. Afterwards, we go upstairs and brush our teeth. I have to do special stretching exercises for the muscles in my chest and legs, or I get pains when I run and play. I do my stretching before I get into bed. After my exercises, either my brother or I turn off the lights. We share a bedroom, so we take turns turning the light off. Before we get into bed, we say our prayers. After we get into our beds, my brother and I talk to each other for a long time. We tell each other about our day or about what we hope will happen in the future, about our friends, and all sorts of other important things. After a while, we get so tired we just fall asleep in the middle of talking. Even though we go to bed at eight thirty p.m., we talk so long we don't go to sleep until about ten o'clock p.m. I still do not know why I have to go to bed so early when I'm not even tired. Why do I like mathematics? Sometimes there is a problem in life that has no answer. Perhaps a child has trouble learning. Perhaps someone becomes ill. Perhaps there was love, but now there is conflict. These problems are hard to solve. There is no single answer. Many people have opinions on what is the best answer, but in mathematics there is an answer, a single answer that is right. There is no doubt. There is no argument. This answer is right. If we ask, "What is five plus seven?" the answer is twelve. If we ask, "How do you raise a child?" The answer would depend on the child and the parents. Sometimes there is more than one way to reach an answer. Imagine we want to find the area of a triangle. The triangle has a right angle. The two sides surrounding the right angle are twenty millimeters and thirty millimeters. The formula for the area of a triangle is one half of base height. We could consider the twenty millimeter side as the base, and thirty millimeters as the height. We could consider the thirty millimeter side as the base, and the twenty millimeter side as the height. Both ways would produce the same answer. The area is three hundred square millimeters. 
Alternatively, we could consider the base as the third side of the triangle, and then we would have to draw a height and measure it. The height would be neither twenty nor thirty, but still we would end up with the same answer. In math, the answer does not change. Another reason I like math is the way it brings order. There can be a whole set of numbers or a whole set of measurements that mean nothing until mathematics organizes them into a pattern. An average number can be found. Graphs can be drawn. The spread of the numbers and probabilities of a certain number happening can be calculated. This is like having a whole lot of dirty dishes after supper. Applying math is like washing and sorting the dishes and putting them back into the cupboard. Math is a powerful tool. Math should be our friend, and we will find more ways to use it to better our lives. My sister's visit to Canada. My sister had never been to Canada, but came for a visit last April. I picked her up at the airport in Toronto and drove her through the traffic and multi-lane highways, past the grapevines and peach trees to Niagara Falls, where I live. She was very tired from the flight and soon slept. The first day, we walked to see the falls. The spray from the falls drifts high into the air and across the people standing to watch. There are people from all over the world watching the water and using their cameras. Because it was April, there was still ice beside the water, huge chunks of ice that looked like white rocks. In the river, there were floating pieces of ice moving downstream. The next day, we went to the town where the Niagara River joins Lake Ontario. The weather was warm. We walked a long way, and our feet were hot. So we went down to the edge of the water to put our feet in. One toe in was enough. The water was so cold it made our feet ache. A piece of ice drifted beside our feet. I put one foot in for a second, then out, as the pain of the cold went right through me. My sister could not understand how it could be so warm, but there was still ice. Another day, we went to see my daughter. She is living on a farm, an hour's drive away. We walked through her trees. The buds were starting to turn into leaves. We stopped and looked at the spring wildflowers. We climbed across a creek by walking over a fallen tree. We saw the footprints of raccoons by the water. There was fresh air and sunshine and blue sky. On the way home, we stopped for hamburgers and fries at a drive-through restaurant. She had never been to a drive-through restaurant before. Then we went to a donut shop. There are no donut shops where she lives. There was a choice of twenty different types of donuts: some round, some with holes, some with frosting, some with jam inside. Each was different. The days passed quickly, and soon it was time to take her back to the airport. Some of the trees now had leaves. Some of the tulips were now blooming. It was hard to say goodbye to my sister. I hope we can visit again soon. A summer Sunday. Today the sun was warm. The sky was blue with a few white clouds. It was a good day to pick strawberries. It was a good day to go to the beach. I drove to a pick-your-own farm where people can pick their own fruit and buy it. There, the fruit is very fresh and delicious. The owner of the farm gave everyone a row to pick their strawberries. Everyone was wearing sun hats. I knelt down on the straw between the rows and picked the big, juicy red berries. I tasted one. It was warm from the sun. When I bit into it, the juice was sweet and strong. When three big pails were full, I went to pay for them and picked up some recipes for some strawberry desserts. I packed two of the pails in a cooler with some ice, and the other one we would eat at the beach. I met my daughter at the beach. 
she had a soft pink blanket on the sand. This beach is beside a lake, and across the lake, about 50 kilometers away, the large city can sometimes be seen. Today, the wind blew cooler air across the lake over the people on the beach. There were children playing in the water. One man helped his son dig holes in the sand, and the water ran into the holes. One lady held her children's hands and walked down into the water. Families climbed over the rocks and sat on the last rock where the water was deep. Teenagers rode bicycles and rollerblades along the path beside the beach. Adults walked and ran along this path, carrying water bottles around their waists. We sat on the blanket and ate sandwiches of meat and lettuce and strawberries from the pail. We talked and read books and lay in the sun, relaxing. We wore sunscreen, but our skin was getting hot. How cold was the water? We walked across the sand that almost burned our feet to the edge of the water. She went right in and lay down floating. I put my toes in and felt the chill through my body. I went up to my knees, then my thighs, but that was far enough. My whole body was cooled down. I headed back to the blanket to lay in the sun again. Soon it was time to go home. She was coming to my house for supper. We drove down the highway with the windows open and our hair blowing in the warm breeze. We cut the strawberries up and made a strawberry dessert with cake and ice cream. We sat outside in the backyard under the maple trees with the birds singing around us and ate our supper. It was a perfect ending to a relaxing summer day. My parents. My parents live in England and I live in Canada. I don't see them often. They used to come and visit on a plane, and we would pick them up at Toronto Airport. But now they are older and say the flight is too long for them. I went to visit them last year with my son, their grandson. They live by the ocean, and we could hear the sound of the waves through the bedroom window and see the blue water of the English Channel. There is an island with a castle on top in the bay. We walked many times on the beach and picked up pebbles and feathers. We visited the island and walked up the steep hill to the castle. My mother likes to cook. She makes delicious cakes and pies. We went for a hike and picked wild blackberries. She made them into a pie that smelled so good coming out of the oven and tasted so good on our plates. She has many cookbooks with recipes from all over the world and likes to try new things. She can make pastry very easily and rolls it with a rolling pin quickly. When I tried to make pastry, it sticks to the rolling pin. It has holes at the bottom of the pie and it tastes like a rock. Her pastry is crisp and tender. My father likes to garden. He grows lettuce, carrots, potatoes, tomatoes, cucumbers, and many flowers. When my mother was very ill last year, she had to stay in bed. He planted roses outside her bedroom window so she could open the curtains and see them. Their house has a small room with windows all around, and they plant seeds there in winter in small pots. The warmth from the sun makes the seeds grow, and in spring they are a good size to be planted outside. In the house beside them and in the house in front of them, there are older ladies whose husbands have died. These ladies do not drive, so my father takes my mother and the two ladies to the town for shopping every week. He helps one find her groceries because she cannot see well. He helps her take tapes of books from the library so she can listen to books instead of reading them because of her eyes. He helps them cut their grass and fix anything that is broken in the house. I am very proud of my parents. They are over 80 years old and often hurt when they move around, but still, they help other people and they help each other. They have been married for over 50 years, but still, my father loves my mother enough to plant roses for her to cheer her up when she was ill. The Planets of Our Solar System The planet on which we live is called the Earth, 
Our planet is constantly moving around the sun, and each year the Earth travels all the way around the sun. But there are many other planets that also travel around the sun. Together with the sun, the planets, and various other bodies, the Earth is part of our solar system. The planet that is closest to the sun is Mercury. Mercury is extremely hot, and it is much smaller than the Earth. The second planet from the sun is Venus. Venus is about the same size as the Earth. Venus is also very hot. The Earth is the third planet from the sun. The Earth is unusual among the planets because it has such a large moon. The Earth is bigger than the moon, but the moon is still quite large. It takes about one month for the moon to travel around the Earth. The fourth planet from the sun is Mars. Mars is known for its red color. Mars is smaller and colder than the Earth. Mars has two very small moons. After the planet Mars, there are many small bodies called the asteroids. These rocky objects are much smaller than the planets. The first four planets are all made of rock and metal. The remaining planets, however, are mostly made of frozen gases. The fifth planet is called Jupiter. Jupiter is the largest planet. It has many moons that travel around it, and it also has a large red spot. The sixth planet is called Saturn. Saturn is the second largest planet, and it is famous for the wide rings that surround it. These rings are made up of many smaller objects that are found in the same area. The seventh planet is called Uranus. The eighth planet is called Neptune. These planets are also gas giants, but they are smaller than Jupiter and Saturn. Both Uranus and Neptune are so far from the sun that scientists only discovered these planets during the past few hundred years using telescopes. The other planets had all been visible to curious people for many thousands of years. The ninth planet is called Pluto. Pluto is very small, and it is much more rocky than the gas giants. Some scientists believe that Pluto is not really a planet at all. They suggest that Pluto is the largest of many asteroids that are found at the edge of the solar system. The solar system is a vast place. So far, people have not traveled beyond the moon, but perhaps some day, human astronauts will visit the other planets of our solar system. Education systems in Canada. In Canada, each province is responsible for its own education systems. In general, there are three levels of education systems in Canada: one, kindergarten to grade eight; two, grade nine to grade twelve; three, post-secondary education. Kindergarten may further be divided into junior and senior kindergarten for four and five-year-old children, respectively. Grades nine to twelve students are enrolled in a secondary school system, which is similar to a high school system in the USA. Some cities and towns may have a junior high school system, which accommodates children from grade seven to grade nine. In the province of Ontario, there is grade thirteen, which is a required step for all students who want to attend a degree-granting university. This feature has been unique for Ontario, but the province has decided to abolish it in order to be consistent with other provinces' secondary education systems. By year two thousand and three, when grade thirteen is completely abandoned, the number of students entering a university or college is expected to be almost doubled, called double cohort. Post-secondary education system in Canada includes universities, community colleges, university colleges, and other private institutions providing post-secondary education, such as skill training and continuing education. A university is a standing-alone, degree-granting institution that offers certificates, diplomas, and bachelor, master, PhD degrees. There are about fifty universities throughout the country. Most of which are publicly funded institutions. Some of the most recognized universities include the University of Toronto, McGill University, the University of British Columbia, and Queen's University.
A community college offers a variety of programs for students who want to learn technical skills, skills that they can apply to the real world quickly. These programs are usually one or two years in length, emphasizing hands-on experience in a classroom setting. It grants certificates and diplomas, and offers a variety of training courses for people who want to upgrade themselves with the current markets and new technologies. A university college, as the name implies, is somewhat in between a community college and a university. This type of institution is common in British Columbia, the most western province in Canada. It grants certificates and diplomas by itself. However, it is not able to grant university degrees alone, although it often offers all the courses required for a university degree. The curriculum for a degree program is usually designed in conjunction with the university, which actually grants degrees to the university college students. Business education. What is business? A business includes all the activities involved to create and sell a product or service. The most important functional areas of business include accounting, finance, marketing, production, operations, and human resources management. Accounting is a field of business that records and reports the flow of funds through a firm on a historical basis and produces important financial statements such as balance sheets and income statements. It also produces forecasts of future conditions such as projected financial statements and financial budgets and evaluates the firm's financial performance against the forecasts. The finance area of business supports a firm in decisions concerning the financing of the firm's business and the allocation and control of financial resources within the firm. Major activities of finance include cash and investment management, capital budgeting, financial forecasting, and financial planning. The cash and investment management activities forecast and manage the firm's cash position and short-term and other securities. The capital budgeting activity involves evaluating the profitability and risk of proposed capital expenditures. The financial planning process evaluates the present and projected financial performance of the firm and projects the firm's future financial needs. The marketing function of business is concerned with the planning, promotion, sale, and distribution of existing products or services in existing markets, and the development of new products and new services in order to better serve existing and potential customers with quality products and services. It is also responsible for customer relationship management, product planning, pricing, advertising, after-sales service, and market research and forecasting. The production operations function focuses on the management of all activities concerned with the planning and control of the process producing goods or services. These activities include purchasing of raw material and parts, product design, inventory, manufacturing processes, facilities, location and layout, quality control, and such other logistics as distribution and transportation. The human resource management function involves the recruitment. Placement, evaluation, compensation, and development of a firm's employees, with the main goal of the effective and efficient use of a firm's human capital. The human resources management function supports planning to meet the personal needs of the business, development of employees to their full potential, and control of all personnel policies and programs. While each of the aforementioned functional areas within a firm used to operate somewhat independently with its own objectives and resources, information and other computer technologies have integrated all business functions within the firm and created something called an internet worked e-business enterprise. Strategic uses of information technology. What is information technology? How can information technology be used in an organization to improve its efficiency? How much investment should an organization make in information technology? What are the business benefits and opportunities an organization may achieve from using information technology? These are some of the most important questions many organizations ask themselves before investing their capitals in information technology. In an academic term, information technology is defined as hardware, 
software, telecommunications, database management, and other information processing technologies used in computer-based information systems. There are many ways that organizations may view and use information technology. However, in today's competitive business environment, technology is no longer an afterthought in forming business strategy, but it is the actual cause and driver. In other words, for a firm to maintain or improve its business competitiveness, it must use information technology to achieve strategic advantage. Information technology can help a company substantially reduce the cost of business processes and lower the costs of customers or suppliers. Information technology can help a company differentiate its products and services from others. Using information technology, a firm can create new products and services or make radical changes to business processes. A firm can use information technology to manage regional and global business expansion or to diversify and integrate into other products and services. A firm can use information technology to create virtual organizations of business partners or to develop alliances with customers, suppliers, and other business partners. Information technology can dramatically improve the efficiency of business processes and the quality of products and services. Using information technology, a firm can build a strategic information base of all the information collected. Some experts argue that use of information technology has become a strategic necessity rather than a strategic advantage, because most competitive advantages don't last more than a few years. Whether the statement is true or not, most companies may not want to wait too long before investing in information technology, because it would be tough to catch up later once you get behind your competitors, especially when everyone is playing with newer, better technology. The first five years of my life in Canada. I left Korea 25 years ago for Toronto, Ontario, Canada. I was 17 years old at that time. Now everyone knows how old I am. As any immigrant who left his or her own country for a new place looking for a better life, I believe the first five years of my living in Canada were the most challenging ones. It did not take a long time for me to realize that I would have to face one of the biggest challenges in my life, the language problem. Although I had learned English in high school for almost five years before coming to Canada, I did not find it useful in day-to-day -day living at this new place. My frustrations stemming from lack of my English conversation skills included ordering food at a fast food restaurant, phone conversation, and conversations with neighbors. The most frustrating moment was my inability to explain to other people when I was accused of something I did not do. Knowing that I was not able to defend myself properly due to lack of conversation skills, a few people often took advantage of me for their own benefits. However, throughout the years, I met a lot of good people who gave me strength and encouragement. Among those people in my heart, I still remember Mrs. Overholtz. Mrs. Overholtz was working in the counselor's office at the high school I attended for two years, and she gave me a lot of valued advice and direction in regards to my academic life as well as my personal one. My dear friends in my high school also helped me, not only to survive in the new country, but also taught me the new cultures and systems. Some of them went to the same university as I did, while others went to different institutions. I am still in contact with many of them, but wherever they are, I believe they are making a positive contribution to the society. I owe the most to my father, my mother, who passed away seven years ago, and my brothers. We were neither rich nor poor, but we stuck together all the time. My parents taught me love, care, and kindness through their actions, not just their words. It was from my family that I got strength when I was weak. It was my family who listened to me when I needed to talk. It was my family who really was happy for me when I told them good news.
The first five years of my life in Canada surely was one of the most difficult times in my life. I believe, however, that it was also an important time in my life for me to become a more mature and independent human being. I thank all of those who played a role in some way to help me out during the transition period of my life. Great Lakes The Great Lakes are a group of five large freshwater lakes in North America that are interconnected by natural and artificial channels. They are from east to west, Lake Ontario, Lake Erie, Lake Huron, Lake Michigan, and Lake Superior. Most of them, except Lake Michigan, which lies entirely within the United States, form part of the border between the United States and Canada. The Great Lakes are bordered by the Canadian province of Ontario and by eight U.S. states, including from west to east, Wisconsin, Minnesota, Illinois, Indiana, Ohio, Michigan, Pennsylvania, and New York. Large cities like Chicago, Detroit, Cleveland, and Toronto lie on the shores of the Great Lakes system. The Great Lakes system, with a combined surface area of 244,100 square kilometers, holds about 20% of the world's fresh surface water. Lake elevations decrease to the east and south. Lake Superior, the largest lake, at 82,100 square kilometers, is also the largest freshwater lake in the world. Its outlet is the St. Mary's River, which enters Lake Huron after falling about 7 meters over a series of rapids. Lake Huron and Lake Michigan lie at the same elevation. Water flows from Lake Michigan to Lake Huron. Lake Michigan is deeper than Lake Huron, but the latter is larger in area, at 59,600 square kilometers. Lake Huron drains into the St. Clair River, which falls about three meters between Lake Huron and the small, shallow basin of Lake St. Clair. Lake St. Clair is connected to Lake Erie by the Detroit River. At its northeast end, Lake Erie empties into the Niagara River, which drops 99 meters as it flows north to Lake Ontario, which is the smallest of the Great Lakes, at 19,010 square kilometers. Lake Ontario is linked with the Atlantic Ocean via the St. Lawrence River. The Great Lakes, interconnected by rivers, straits, and canals, are a natural resource of tremendous significance in North America. They serve as the focus of the industrial heartland of the continent and together form one of the world's busiest shipping arteries. The lakes also form an important recreational resource, with about 17,000 kilometers of shoreline, rich sport fisheries, and numerous beaches and marinas. Canadian Rocky Mountains Some of the best-known mountain scenery on Earth is concentrated in a set of seven parks in the Canadian Rocky Mountains. There are four national parks in the Canadian Rockies, Banff, Jasper, Yoho and Kootenai, and three British Columbia provincial parks, Mount Robson, Mount Assiniboine, and Hamber. The seven preserves located along the Alberta-British Columbia border attract more than nine million people annually. Banff National Park became Canada's first national park in 1885 and the birthplace of Canada's national park system. It is home to a variety of distinctive natural features and cultural and historical sites. Rugged mountains, glaciers, ice fields, alpine meadows, beautiful blue cold water lakes, mineral hot springs, deep canyons, and hoodoos compose the natural landscape and habitat for a great variety of mammals such as elk, bighorn sheep, black and grizzly bear, and caribou. Jasper National Park is the largest and most northerly of the Canadian Rocky Mountain parks. The park is less commercialized than Banff, so it can still keep many natural beauties and scenery. Its scenery includes deeply gouged Malign Canyon, picturesque Malign Lake, the thunder of Sunwapta Falls, the serene beauty of glacier-covered Mount Edith Cavell, and Miette Hot Springs. As one of 39 national parks in Canada, Kootenai National Park represents the southwestern slopes of the Canadian Rocky Mountains. From glacier-clad peaks to semi-arid grasslands, where even cactus grows, Kootenai is rich in variety and is one of the largest protected areas in the world. Yoho National Park, representing the western slopes of the Rocky Mountains region, holds the secrets of ancient ocean life, the power of ice and water, and unique plant and animal communities that continue to evolve today. 
Awe and wonder is a natural response for this place of rock walls, spectacular waterfalls, and soaring peaks. The Burgess Shale contains one of the world's most significant finds of soft-bodied Middle Cambrian Age marine fossils, with about 150 species, including some bearing no resemblance to known animals. These four Canadian national parks account for 14,300 square miles. The four national parks, along with the three British Columbia provincial parks, form the UNESCO Rocky Mountain Parks World Heritage Site, one of the largest protected areas in the world. For the record, what is the world's tallest mountain and highest elevation? Of course, Mount Everest, on the border of Nepal and Tibet, China, is the world's tallest mountain and highest elevation. With a peak at 29,035 feet, or 8,850 meters, the National Geographic Society revised the height of Mount Everest in 1999 from 29,028 feet, or 8,848 meters, due to new GPS calculations. What is the world's tallest mountain from base to peak? Mauna Kea in Hawaii is the one. Its base is on the sea floor and rises 33,480 feet, or 10,314 meters in total, reaching 13,796 feet, or 4,205 meters above sea level. In reference to its towering height of 20,320 feet above sea level, Mount McKinley in Alaska is the tallest mountain in North America. It has been named the Roof of North America or the Chimney of North America. Located about 55 kilometers drive from Amman, Jordan, the Dead Sea in the Middle East region is the lowest point on Earth. The sunset touching distant hills with ribbons of fire across the waters of the Dead Sea brings a sense of unreality. To culminate a day's visit to the lowest point on Earth, some 1,320 feet or 400 meters below sea level. En route, a stone marker indicates sea level, but the Dead Sea itself is not reached before descending another 400 meters below this sign. As the name suggests, the sea is devoid of life due to an extremely high content of salts and minerals. But it is these natural elements which give the waters their curative powers, recognized since the days of Herod the Great, more than 2,000 years ago. They also provide the raw materials for the renowned Jordanian Dead Sea bath salts and cosmetic products, which are marketed worldwide. Badwater Basin, the floor of Death Valley National Park in California, is the lowest point in the Western Hemisphere, with 282 feet or 85 meters below sea level. Death Valley National Park, established in 1933, has more than 3.3 million acres of spectacular desert scenery, interesting and rare desert wildlife, complex geology, undisturbed wilderness, and sites of historical and cultural interest. Sport Canada. Sport Canada is the name of Canada's federal government program to help support athletes. The purpose of Sport Canada is to develop and encourage sport, health, and exercise programs for all Canadians. However, Sport Canada's main emphasis is on high-performance athletes training for major international athletic competitions, such as the Olympic Games. Sport Canada was created in the 1970s as a response to the perceived need to help athletes train and compete in international sport. Before the 1970s, athletes wishing to train and compete in sport had to support themselves financially. Athletes were either independently wealthy or were supported by family or friends. Unfortunately, many high-caliber athletes without such financial support simply could not afford to train and compete in international competition. Also, before the early 1970s, almost all international sports events were amateur. Amateur rules meant those receiving funds from government programs or corporations were breaking the rules of sport. Athletes receiving money were disqualified from competition. As a result, the amateur rules generally limited training and competition to those athletes who came from wealthier families. Less fortunate athletes, many of whom likely would have performed well for Canada in international competitions, simply could not afford to do so. Sport Canada has been a role model for many government-run sport programs around the world. 
With its central administrative offices in Canada's capital of Ottawa, Sport Canada efficiently provides administrative, coaching, and financial help for athletes across the country. Athletes can concentrate their efforts full time on training and competition. As a result, Canada's share of the medal totals in the Olympic Games has risen since the 1970s. Recently, Sport Canada's programs have been criticized by some who feel that the program does not provide enough money for athletes. While it does provide financial assistance to athletes, the amount paid is well below Canada's minimum wage. Critics point out that athletes work full time and perform an important function for the Canadian government and people. As a result of this criticism, the Canadian government has provided more money for athletes. However, the amount is still below the minimum wage level. As a result, the amount paid to athletes is likely to rise in the future. As long as it effectively manages problems such as funding, Sport Canada will continue to provide the Canadian public with international caliber athletes who compete with the very best in the world. Drug use in sport. Athletes using drugs to enhance performance has become one of the greatest problems facing elite international sport. Major sports organizations, such as the International Olympic Committee, are putting a lot of time, effort, and money into the detection of drugs. The race between athletes using drugs and detection agencies seems to be just as fierce as sport competition itself. Athletes have been using drugs or other stimulants to enhance performance for centuries. Even athletes in the ancient Olympic Games in Greece used various stimulants to enhance performance. However, since the 1950s, the degree of drug use has risen to a level never before seen in human athletic history. Drug testing began in the Olympic Games in the 1960s. One of the first sports to encounter drug use was cycling. During the 1960 Summer Olympic Games in Rome, Italy, a cyclist died from an amphetamine use. In 1967, another cyclist died in the Tour de France cycling race. Around the same period, bodybuilders in the United States were experimenting with newly developed synthetic steroids that built muscle mass. As a result, the International Olympic Committee started testing for steroids during the 1976 Olympic Games in Montreal, Canada. Probably the most famous case of an athlete using drugs was Canadian sprinter Ben Johnson. After winning the 100 meter sprint in the 1988 Summer Olympic Games in Seoul, South Korea, Johnson's drug test was found to be positive. Johnson took a synthetic steroid to build muscle mass and enhance power. Eventually, Johnson was stripped of his gold medal. In the aftermath of Johnson's positive drug test, the Canadian government conducted a federal inquiry into the drug use in Canadian sport. The government inquiry was the largest one to have been conducted in any country up to that point in time. The results of the inquiry found that drug use among Canadian athletes was very common. The inquiry stated that there were problems beyond just individual athletes, such as Johnson taking drugs to enhance performance. Indeed, it was stated that there was a moral crisis throughout sport. Today, the race between drug detection agencies and athletes who use drugs continues. In January 2000, the International Olympic Committee created a new agency to detect drug use the World Anti Doping Agency, WADA. WADA has provided increased resources for drug detection, especially in Olympic sports. Hopefully, WADA will be able to keep pace with the current moral crisis in sport. Participation Participation was the name of the Canadian government program designed to encourage Canadians to get and stay physically fit. Created in 1971 by the federal government, Participation was successful in encouraging Canadians to be active and to stay healthy. Participation was created by the Canadian Liberal government of Prime Minister Pierre Trudeau. Trudeau believed that sport and recreation should play an important role in the lives of Canadian citizens. His government took two steps towards the accomplishment of this goal. First, a government agency was created to provide funds for high performance athletes, such as those training and competing in the Olympic Games. A second agency was created to encourage participation and physical activity in the general Canadian population. It was out of this second agency that participation was born. Participation became famous in the 1970s because of a series of television commercials. 
In these commercials, a young Canadian in his 20s was seen being outrun by a 60-year-old Swedish man. The message was that Canadians had become lazy and inactive. This was probably true of Canadians at the time. Physical fitness was not highly encouraged in schools, especially for women. Also, the government played little role in encouraging physical activity before participation. The result of participation was impressive. Canadians became more active in the years following the program's inception. Also, fitness and activity were encouraged through physical education programs. Participation was seen as a positive program because it got Canadians active while reducing health care costs caused by inactivity and poor physical conditioning. Recently, participation was terminated by the federal government because of a lack of funding. Many people thought this was a shame given the positive messages the program gave to otherwise inactive Canadians. Despite the program's termination, participation has made a long-lasting impression on Canadians. Hopefully, its positive example of physical fitness for Canadians will continue in the future. The Olympic Games The modern Olympic Games began in the late 19th century as a revival of the ancient Greek Olympics. Now, just over 100 years old, the modern Olympic movement is the biggest and most important sports movement in the world. In fact, many people believe the Olympic Games to be the most important cultural event of any kind in the world. The modern Olympic Games were the brainchild of Frenchman Baron Pierre de Coubertin. De Coubertin's dream for an international sports event and cultural movement became a reality in 1894 at the International Athletic Congress in Paris. After the Games were constituted in 1894, the first Olympic Games was held in Athens, Greece in 1896 in recognition of the ancient Greek Olympic Games. The original purpose of the Olympic Games, in de Coubertin's mind, was to celebrate and strengthen the physical, mental and cultural qualities of humanity. The games would blend sport with culture, tradition, and education. The philosophy of Olympism is based on the joy of physical and mental effort and the respect for universal ethical principles. De Coubertin envisioned creating a more noble and sympathetic humanity through the Olympic movement. The sports events themselves de Coubertin modeled after the English public school sports system. He saw in upper-class English boys' sport the qualities of camaraderie, nobility, and honesty. Most importantly, however, was adherence to the rules of sport, in particular the rule that stated sport ought to be amateur in nature. De Coubertin believed participants should never participate in sport for the purpose of making money. To do so would contradict the underlying philosophy of sport. Breaking the amateur rule in de Coubertin's time was as serious a violation as taking drugs to enhance performances in today's world of sport. Over time, the Olympics grew to be the largest international festival of any kind. Today, debates exist as to the degree to which the modern games adhere to de Coubertin's original intent. On the one hand, Olympic sport is truly international in nature, as de Coubertin would have wanted it. On the other hand, it is doubtful that de Coubertin would have admired the existence of politics, commercialism, and drug use in sport. The Olympics have become truly international, but perhaps at a price. There is little question that the Olympic Games hold out the possibility for fulfilling de Coubertin's original goal of sport contributing to a better, more peaceful and understanding world. Newspapers All the great cities in the world now have newspapers. But newspapers as we know them today are not that old. The very first newspapers began long after the invention of printing. They started in Europe in the 1600s and were usually only a couple of pages long. For a long time, newspapers were not very common. Governments didn't want public discussion of their policies and decisions. Often, they closed down papers or taxed them heavily. The stamp tax on newspapers and pamphlets was one of the causes of the American Revolution. Newspapers began to grow in size when they discovered advertising as a source of income. Nowadays, advertising is the main revenue source for most newspapers. As newspapers became more widely circulated, they could ask for more money for their advertisements. By the late 18th century, newspapers were in common use in Europe. 
The 1800s and early 1900s was the golden age of newspapers. Improvements in transportation, communication, and printing processes made it easier to collect news from near and far, and to publish papers more quickly and more cheaply. The Weekly Dispatch and the Times, both of London, England, were leading newspapers through much of the 1800s. The Times was one of the first papers to include illustrations. It was the first newspaper to use a steam engine to turn the presses. When the tax on newspapers was reduced in 1836, the Times was able to increase its size considerably. In 1840, it began to use the telegraph to collect news stories. In 1855, the tax on newspapers was finally lifted. The Times made its greatest reputation during the Crimean War between Britain and Russia. British armies fighting in Russia's Crimean Peninsula were not only unsuccessful in the war, but were suffering severely from illnesses. The Times sent out the world's first war correspondent, William Howard Russell, in 1854. His reports from the battle lines had a powerful effect on the British public. A war fund was organized to help the soldiers. Russell forced the government to accept the offer of Florence Nightingale to organize nurses to travel to Crimea. A photographer, Roger Fenton, sent back photos from the war, which were published in the Times. Meanwhile, in America, a more popular approach to newspapers had developed. The newspaper had spread west with the pioneers, and nearly every little settlement had its own paper. American newspapers were cheaper and livelier than British ones. They were aimed at the average person rather than the governing class. Examples of the new style of editing and publishing were Joseph Pulitzer and William Randolph Hearst. Hearst, especially, employed sensational and emotional writing, which aimed at stirring up the public to action. Hearst is sometimes accused of starting the Spanish-American War of 1898 with his overheated editorials. Nonetheless, his methods were successful in raising circulation and were widely imitated. The modern newspaper contains more than hard news. In fact, news may be a fairly small part of it: advertisements, gossip. Show business, photos of celebrities, sports, stock market prices, horoscopes, comic strips, weather reports, and much more are found in its pages. The modern newspaper is a total entertainment package. A question for the future is whether electronic newspapers will replace paper newspapers. Paul Kane, frontier artist. Since Christopher Columbus first met American Indians in 1492, many Europeans had been fascinated by Indian life and culture. As a result, there was a demand in Europe for drawings and paintings of Native Americans. European artists who had never seen an Indian supplied most of this demand, but in the 19th century, several painters traveled into Indian territory to make an authentic record of Native life. One of the first artists to do this was the American painter George Catlin. In 1841, Catlin published a book of his work. Catlin's work helped inspire another important frontier artist, the Canadian Paul Kane. Paul Kane was born in Ireland in 1810. His family moved to Toronto, Ontario, Canada, when Paul was nine years old. The young boy was not very interested in school. At that time, there were still Indians living in wigwams in the Toronto area. Young Paul liked visiting the Indian village instead of going to school. Since Paul spent little time in school, he was largely a self-taught artist. He also became a surprisingly good writer, considering that he had not spent much time studying spelling or grammar. After working some years making and decorating furniture, Kane was ready to travel. He spent the years from 1836 to 1841 living and traveling in the United States. Then he traveled in Europe from 1841 to 1843, studying the great painters of the past. He was back in the USA until 1845, and then he returned to Toronto. Immediately upon his return, Kane headed into the wilderness areas around Georgian Bay, Sault Ste. Marie, and Lake Michigan. His plan was to sketch Indian life before it disappeared forever. American Indians were dying so rapidly from European diseases such as measles and smallpox that many people believed they would soon vanish as a race. 
Their culture was threatened, too. As white settlers demanded more land, Indians were being herded into small pieces of land called reservations. Here they could no longer practice their traditional way of life. Kane wanted to capture Native American life while it still existed. Kane returned to Toronto at the end of 1845. He had received one good piece of advice, and that was if he wanted to travel into the wilderness, he would have to go with experienced people. He was able to get the support of the governor of the Hudson's Bay Company, Sir George Simpson. In May 1846, Kane joined the annual canoe fleet of fur traders going west. Kane would travel all through the wilderness areas of western Canada and northwestern USA. During this time, he made hundreds of sketches of Indian life. Although Kane faced incredible hardships during his travels, he was able to see what he wanted to see. He was able to take part in one of the last great buffalo hunts and killed two large bison himself. Traveling west with the fur traders, he visited many forts and trading posts. He saw and painted a prairie fire. He shot a grizzly bear at close range and killed several wolves that attacked his horses. He learned to travel long distances on snowshoes in winter. Finally, he arrived at the Pacific Coast, where he made some fine drawings of the West Coast Indians. European diseases had reached there just before Cain. 1,500 Indians had died near Fort Vancouver in the summer of 1848. One wealthy chief had ruled 1,000 warriors and had 10 wives, 4 children, and 18 slaves. Now, he had only one wife, one child, and two slaves. Cain had not come too soon. However, there were tribes still unaffected by Western culture and Western diseases. Cain also traveled widely around the Columbia River in northwestern USA. Everywhere he went, he sketched Indian chiefs and scenes of native life. On his return trip, he encountered a large war party of 1,500 braves on the warpath against their traditional enemies. He was able to sketch the leading chief, Big Snake, who was later killed in single combat during the battle. When he arrived back in Toronto, Kane gave an exhibit of his sketches and watercolors. Most of the rest of his life was spent turning these drawings into finished paintings. Plains Indians The best-known picture of an American Indian is a warrior in buckskin riding a horse, wearing a headdress of eagle feathers, and carrying a spear or bow and arrow. This is a picture of a Plains Indian, and it appears in many Hollywood westerns and on the American five-cent piece. There were many tribes of Plains Indians, for the northern American prairies or plains stretch from the northern forest of western Canada down to the states of Oklahoma and Texas in southern USA. It's interesting that our image of the Plains Indian is only true for the last couple hundred years. It was not until the 1600s that Plains Indians began to ride horses. There were no horses in America until Spanish soldiers brought them in the 1500s and 1600s. Some of these horses escaped and ran wild on the prairies of America. It was these wild horses that the Plains Indians learned to tame. Before they had horses, the Indians hunted buffalo on foot. Buffalo were huge bison, or wild cattle, which traveled in very large herds. A big herd might have millions of buffalo. It was difficult to cross the prairie because these animals blocked your way. The Plains Indians had various ways of killing buffalo. Before they had horses, Indian hunters would quietly creep up close to the herd. Then they would fire their arrows together. There was always the danger that the herd would stampede and trample the hunters. Another method was to drive the buffalo over a steep cliff. There are a number of places on the plains where this was done. Once the plains Indians had horses, they preferred to hunt buffalo on horseback. When the tribe started to use guns, they could kill many buffalo. Artist Paul Kane describes a buffalo hunt in the Red River Valley in 1846. The hunters carried their bullets in their mouths so that they could shoot faster. They could ride right into the herd, shooting at close quarters. They would drop an article of clothes on the slain buffalo to mark it for themselves. Then they would continue the hunt. After the hunt, the Indians would skin the animals, and the women would dry the meat and store it in fat. A single hunt might kill more than 30,000 buffalo. The Plains Indians received nearly everything they needed from the buffalo. 
Of course, they used buffalo meat for food. They also used the buffalo skins for clothing, blankets, and the covering of their teepees. These teepees were cone-shaped tents, which were easy to put up and take down. The Plains Indians were nomadic and followed the animals they hunted. Since these animals were plentiful, Plains Indians usually led a comfortable life. They developed complex religions and social rituals, as well as specialized societies or clubs. There were also rituals and customs for hunting and warfare. Many Plains Indians fought hard against the settlement of the Great Plains. The American government discouraged the hunting of buffalo because without the buffalo, the Plains Indians would not be able to fight. With the buffalo disappearing, the Plains Indians had to give up fighting and move into government-sponsored reservations. Pocahontas and John Smith. In 1606, King James of England approved the establishment of two colonies along the eastern coast of America. The northern colony in Maine lasted only a year. The southern one at Jamestown in Virginia became England's first permanent settlement in America. In 1607, the Virginia Company sent 104 settlers to Virginia. The settlers lived in tents all summer. By September, more than 60 were dead because they lacked good food or water. The leaders of the colony were not energetic and did little to make the settlers find food. One member of the company, Captain John Smith, was determined that the colony would survive. Smith pressured the colonists to build huts, a storehouse, and a church. He made daring trips to Indian villages, demanding that they give the settlers food in return for beads and copper. He threatened settlers who were trying to leave the colony and go back to England. On one of his trips to the interior, Indians attacked John Smith. They killed his two companions, but captured him alive. He was taken first to the local chief. This chief was impressed by Smith's compass and spared his life. His captors dragged Smith from village to village. He finally arrived at the town belonging to Powhatan. Powhatan was a great chief for all of the tribes in that region. Powhatan and his advisers talked about what to do with Smith. Suddenly, Smith was dragged forward, and his head was pushed against a stone. The warriors raised their clubs to kill Smith. Then Pocahontas, who was Powhatan's twelve-year-old daughter, begged for his life. Her words had no effect, so Pocahontas ran to Smith. She took his hand in her arms and laid her own head against his head. Smith was released and went back to Jamestown. Soon after Smith returned, one hundred new settlers from England arrived. It was a very cold winter, and in January, Jamestown was accidentally set on fire. The settlers suffered from cold and hunger the rest of the winter. Every four or five days, Pocahontas and her attendants came. They brought food for the hungry settlers. Even so, half of them died. In the summer, John Smith explored that part of the coast of America. He made a map that would be very valuable for future sailors and settlers. On his return, Smith was elected leader of the colony at Jamestown. However, some settlers did not like having to follow rules. Some encouraged the Indians to try to kill Smith. Chief Powhatan agreed. He also refused to supply food to the colony, hoping to starve them out. Pocahontas warned Smith about the plot against his life. Smith had to fight off several attempts to kill him. Finally, the colony seemed to be growing, and the Indians became peaceful. But in late 1609, Smith was injured in an explosion and returned to England. Pocahontas remained a friend to the colony. She married John Rolfe, one of the settlers. In 1616, she traveled to England with her husband and son. There, she saw John Smith once again. She was so surprised to see him that she was unable to speak for several days. Pocahontas had believed that Smith was dead. The following year, she died and was buried in England. Pocahontas's love for Smith and Smith's determination to fight for the colony had saved Jamestown and given the English their first colony in America. Remember the Alamo. The first Europeans in the American Southwest were Spanish explorers and conquerors. They were followed by religious orders that set up missions to Christianize the Indians. One of these missions was San Antonio de Valero. It was founded in 1718 in what is now San Antonio, Texas. Later, the mission structure became known as the Alamo. 
In 1821, Moses Austin had persuaded the Spanish authorities to give him a charter to settle 200,000 acres in Texas. The elder Austin died shortly after this. Five weeks later, his son Stephen Austin traveled to San Antonio to have this charter confirmed by the Spanish governor. In 1822, Austin led 150 settlers into Texas. When Austin learned afterwards that Mexico was now independent of Spain, he journeyed to Mexico City to have his charter reconfirmed. The Mexicans appointed Austin regional administrator for his colony. Texas grew rapidly. Cotton farming and cattle ranching were profitable and attracted American settlers. By 1830, there were 16,000 Americans in Texas, four times the Spanish-Mexican population. Sam Houston had been a successful soldier and politician. He was a friend and supporter of President Andrew Jackson. However, personal problems and political difficulties led him to leave the USA for Texas. Meanwhile, the struggle for control of Mexico had been won in 1833 by Santa Ana. However, the independent thinking of the Texans infuriated Santa Ana. He had Stephen Austin thrown in jail and sent an army into Texas. Austin was released from jail in time to organize the defense of Texas. The Mexican army was besieged inside the Alamo and, after fierce fighting, surrendered. The Mexicans were allowed to go home. Sam Houston was now elected the state's supreme commander. Not long after this, Santa Ana approached Texas with an army of 6,000 men. Houston decided not to meet Santa Ana in open battle, but to wait for an advantage. He sent frontiersman Jim Bowie to the Alamo. Bowie's orders were to leave San Antonio and destroy the Alamo. When Bowie arrived, however, Texas volunteers were preparing the Alamo for a siege. Bowie and his men pitched in to help. Other volunteers came. The fiery William Travis arrived with 25 men. Then the famous frontiersman, Davy Crockett, came with a dozen Tennessee sharpshooters. When Santa Ana attacked, there were 183 Americans inside the fort. Santa Ana brought up cannon to bombard the Alamo. As the walls began to crumble, 4,000 Mexicans attacked from all four sides. The Mexicans overcame all resistance because of their large numbers, but they suffered very heavy losses. All the American defenders were killed. While the battle was raging, the Texans back at the colony declared their independence from Mexico. Sam Houston now gathered men to fight the Mexican army. At first he retreated while waiting for a suitable opportunity. When Santa Ana's rapid advance left the bulk of the Mexican army behind, Houston prepared to fight. Santa Ana's advance troops moved into swampy land by the San Jacinto River. Houston's men attacked while the Mexicans were having their midday siesta. Their battle cry was, Remember the Alamo! The battle was soon over. Many Mexicans were killed, but only a couple of Texans were killed. Santa Ana was a prisoner. Santa Ana readily agreed now to recognize Texas as an independent republic. Ninety years later, in 1845, Texas became the 28th state of the USA. Gribio St. Francis of Assisi, who lived in Italy in the early 13th century, was known for his love of animals. He was the first person who celebrated the birth of Jesus by gathering live animals around a manger. He often talked to the birds as he traveled along. Sometimes the birds would fly down and sit on his head, shoulders, knees, and arms. But the best-known animal story concerns St. Francis and the wolf of Gribio. St. Francis was known for his humility and his unwillingness to hurt anyone. Once, when one of his followers spoke harshly to some bandits, St. Francis told the man to run after the bandits and apologize. In the same way, St. Francis thought of animals as his brothers and sisters. Once, when he was warned about some dangerous wolves, he replied that he had never harmed Brother Wolf and didn't expect the wolf to harm him. While St. Francis was staying in the hill town of Gribio, he heard about a large, fierce wolf. The townspeople were terrified of this wolf and had eaten both domestic animals and humans. St. Francis decided to help the people and went out to talk to the wolf. The people watched in horror as the wolf came running to attack St. Francis. But the saint made the sign of the cross. Then he said to the wolf that, in the name of Jesus, it should stop hurting people. The wolf then lay down at St. Francis's feet. 
St. Francis addressed a little sermon to the wolf. He recounted all the terrible things that the wolf had done, but he added that he wanted to make peace between the wolf and the townspeople. The wolf nodded its head in approval. In return for the wolf's agreement to keep the peace, St. Francis promised him that he would arrange for the townspeople to feed him. When he asked the wolf never again to harm any person or animal, the wolf nodded again. Then the wolf put out its paw as a sign that it would keep its promise. The wolf walked beside St. Francis back into Gribio. When a crowd assembled, the saint preached to them about how God had allowed the wolf to terrify them because of their sins. He told them to repent, and God would forgive them. Then he spoke of the promise that the wolf had made, and what he had promised the wolf in return. The people agreed to feed the wolf regularly, and the wolf again indicated that it would not hurt anyone. Again, it put its paw in St. Francis's hand. The wolf and the people kept the agreement. Two years later, the wolf died. The people remembered how it no longer hurt anyone, and that not a single dog ever barked at it. The townspeople of Gribio lamented its death. Whenever it went through town, it had reminded them of the virtues and holiness of St. Francis. Summertime In North America, July and August are holiday months. Most schools and colleges are not in session then. Families look for activities to keep the children amused. Although not all workers get a full two months of holidays, most people take a holiday in the summer. The summer begins with a national holiday. In Canada, July 1st is Canada Day. In the USA, July 4th is Independence Day. A lot of families are soon on the road. Some travel to cottages by the lake. Some go sightseeing or camping. In Canada especially, the summers are short, so people try to make the most of them. In much of Canada and parts of the northern USA are woodlands dotted with lakes. These regions of rocks, rivers, pine trees, and wild animals are not usually suitable for farming. However, they are ideal places to spend a summer holiday. They are far from the cities. The woods are quiet and peaceful. People fish, go boating or swimming, have barbecues outside, or play outdoor sports. Some people spend their whole summer at the cottage. Others go for a week or two. City people who don't have a cottage like to go to parks and swimming pools in the city. If they are near a lake or ocean, they may go there for the day. Many museums, libraries, and art galleries have programs for children in the summer. Swimming is probably the favorite summer sport. It feels wonderful on a very hot day to jump into the cool water. Swimming is also excellent exercise. Besides swimming, baseball and football are also popular in the summer. Spending an afternoon or evening at a baseball game is a favorite summer pastime. Summer is also a favorite time to catch up on reading. Stories of adventures and love novels are favorite light reading. But summer is especially a time for traveling across the country. Some people have a camper or trailer that they can live in. Some stay in campgrounds and sleep in tents. Others stay at hotels or motels, while others rent cottages or cabins for a week or two. Most trips are by car. Many people visit national parks and other wildlife areas. Of course, trips along the ocean and the lakes are favorites. Along the Atlantic Ocean, the coasts of New England and Canada's maritime provinces are especially popular. On the Pacific coast, tourists travel from California all the way up to Alaska. Boat cruises along the shores of British Columbia and Alaska are especially popular. Of course, some people find it most relaxing just to stay at home. Others cannot afford to travel. If you have an air-conditioned house with a television, video player, CD player, and computer, then it can be very pleasant to stay at home. A lot of new movies are released at the theaters in the summer. Air-conditioned theaters with new movies and lots of pop and popcorn are favorite summer places. After two months of summer activities, most people are ready to go back to school and work, but they usually have lots of happy memories to take back with them. Telephone Systems When Alexander Graham Bell developed the telephone in the 1870s, it was fairly simple to use. You talked into the mouthpiece and then held it to your ear to listen. For a century or so, using the telephone meant either contacting the operator to dial a number or dialing yourself. After that, 
All you had to do was talk or listen. Nowadays, the telephone has become a very complex instrument. It rivals the computer as to the number of possible uses. Answering machines have been around for several decades, but they are now being replaced by voicemail. Voicemail does away with the need for an answering machine. Messages are stored on the system. That means it's possible to forward the message to someone else's phone or transfer the call to a more convenient phone of your own. You can also use call pickup so that anyone on your group can answer another's phone. Conference calls have become very common. This is when one person phones first one person, then another, and keeps adding people to the telephone conversation. This can regularly be done with up to six people. It is very useful for business discussions where different people need to talk about the same thing. It also speeds up the process of consensus and allows everybody to be in on the decision or discussion. The modern phone has many more features. If you don't want the caller to know what is being said in your office, you can push the mute button. If you want to hang up without putting the receiver down, press goodbye. If you don't want to receive calls, just forward them all into your voicemail. Newer phones will indicate when you have voicemail messages. If you have trouble with these features, an automatic voice will tell you your options. This help system is built into the telephone. For example, the help voice will tell you how to set up a distribution list so that you can send the same voice message to a number of people. It will also tell you how to send a message directly into someone's voicemail. You can designate your message to go to the top of the recipient's voicemail list. You can also program it so that the recipient cannot forward it. Some systems have limits on how much space can be used for individual voicemail. There are a number of courtesies that voicemail users should follow. Your greeting on your voicemail should be simple. If you are unable to take calls for any reason, you might want to explain that in your recorded greeting. If you are on vacation, you might want to include that information in your greeting. Don't use voicemail as a way to avoid answering the telephone. Some people use voicemail to screen calls. This can be annoying to someone who can never contact you directly. Check your messages regularly and reply to them promptly. Enjoy the telecommunications revolution. Texas The state of Texas is famous for having the biggest and best of everything. Before Alaska became a state, Texas was the largest American state. It was also famous for its huge cattle ranches. Cotton is a major crop, but much of the wealth comes from oil and gas. People think of Texans as being wealthy because there have been lots of cattle and oil millionaires. In the late 19th century, Texas cattlemen used to drive their herds north to Kansas. There, a train to the east shipped the cows. Eventually, the railroad came to Texas, and the great cattle drive stopped. By then, many Texans owned large ranches and were quite wealthy. In the 20th century, oil has made many Texans wealthy. Oil refining has led to chemical industries and synthetic products. Most Texans now live in cities. Many oil companies have their headquarters in Dallas. Other large manufacturing cities are Houston, Corpus Christi, Fort Worth, and Austin, which is the capital of Texas. Several cities, such as San Antonio and El Paso, have a strong Spanish influence. This dates back to the first Spanish visitors in the 16th century. The old mission at San Antonio is famous as the Alamo, where an important battle for Texas independence was fought. Texas is a huge area with mountains, deserts, prairies, rivers, and islands. The rugged beauty of its grasslands and deserts attracts many tourists. For a state that is mostly dry, Texas has a remarkable variety of wildflowers in the spring. Its animals and birds differ from other parts of the USA. Texas has the armored insect eater, the armadillo, the swift running bird, the road runner, prairie dogs, jackrabbits, kangaroo rats, wild pigs, horned lizards, and 100 species of snakes. As might be expected also, it has many beautiful kinds of cacti and other desert plants. At its largest, Texas is more than 600 miles wide by 600 miles long. Such a large area develops a distinct culture of its own, and Texans are widely recognized by their accent and manner of speaking, their attitudes and interests, and their sense of independence and self-reliance. Texas is also known for its beautiful women, who regularly win national beauty contests. Its men have a reputation for being rugged, for not talking more than they have to, 
and for being straightforward and honest. Although many people think of cowboys and Indians when they think of Texas, it is a center for high-tech industries. The American Space Program has its headquarters in Houston, and Mission Control Center is there. Texas is also an important manufacturer of computers and other high-tech products. Oil production is still important in Texas, but it ranks third as a source of revenue behind manufacturing and tourism. The colorful history of Texas and its wonderful scenery contribute to a thriving tourist industry. Texas is also an important business and financial area. Yes, even though times have changed, Texans proudly maintain that their state still has the biggest and best of everything. George W. Bush inaugural address. President Clinton, distinguished guests, and my fellow citizens, the peaceful transfer of authority is rare in history, yet common in our country. With a simple oath, we affirm old traditions and make new beginnings. As I begin, I thank President Clinton for his service to our nation, and I thank Vice President Gore for a contest conducted with spirit and ended with grace. I am honored and humbled to stand here, where so many of America's leaders have come before me. And so many will follow. We have a place, all of us, in a long story, a story we continue, but whose end we will not see. It is the story of a new world that became a friend and liberator of the old, a story of a slave-holding society that became a servant of freedom, the story of a power that went into the world to protect but not possess, to defend but not to conquer. It is the American story. A story of flawed and fallible people united across the generations by grand and enduring ideals. The grandest of these ideals is an unfolding American promise that everyone belongs, that everyone deserves a chance, that no insignificant person was ever born. Americans are called to enact this promise in our lives and in our laws. And though our nation has sometimes halted and sometimes delayed, we must follow no other course. Through much of the last century. America's faith in freedom and democracy was a rock in a raging sea. Now it is a seed upon the wind, taking root in many nations. Our democratic faith is more than the creed of our country; it is the inborn hope of our humanity, an ideal we carry but do not own, a trust we bear and pass along. And even after nearly 225 years, we have a long way yet to travel. While many of our citizens prosper, others doubt the promise, even the justice of our own country. The ambitions of some Americans are limited by failing schools and hidden prejudice and the circumstances of their birth, and sometimes our differences run so deep it seems we share a continent but not a country. We do not accept this, and we will not allow it. Our unity, our union, is the serious work of leaders and citizens in every generation, and this is my solemn pledge: I will work to build a single nation of justice and opportunity. I know this is in our reach because we are guided by a power larger than ourselves, who creates us equal in His image, and we are confident in principles that unite and lead us onward. America has never been united by blood or birth or soil. We are bound by ideals that move us beyond our backgrounds, lift us above our interests, and teach us what it means to be citizens. Every child must be taught these principles. Every citizen must uphold them. And every immigrant, by embracing these ideals, makes our country more, not less, American. Today, we affirm a new commitment to live out our nation's promise through civility, courage, compassion, and character. America, at its best, matches a commitment to principle with a concern for civility. A civil society demands from each of us goodwill and respect, fair dealing, and forgiveness. Some seem to believe that our politics can afford to be petty because, in a time of peace, the stakes of our debates appear small. George W. Bush inaugural address. But the stakes for America are never small. If our country does not lead the cause of freedom, it will not be led. If we do not turn the hearts of children toward knowledge and character, we will lose their gifts and undermine their idealism. If we permit our economy to drift and decline, the vulnerable will suffer most. We must live up to the calling we share. Civility is not a tactic or a sentiment; it is the determined choice of trust over cynicism, of community over chaos.
And this commitment, if we keep it, is a way to shared accomplishment. America, at its best, is also courageous. Our national courage has been clear in times of depression and war, when defending common dangers defined our common good. Now we must choose if the example of our fathers and mothers will inspire us or condemn us. We must show courage in a time of blessing by confronting problems instead of passing them on to future generations. Together, we will reclaim America's schools before ignorance and apathy claim more young lives. We will reform Social Security and Medicare, sparing our children from struggles we have the power to prevent. And we will reduce taxes to recover the momentum of our economy and reward the effort and enterprise of working Americans. We will build our defenses beyond challenge, lest weakness invite challenge. We will confront weapons of mass destruction so that a new century is spared new horrors. The enemies of liberty in our country should make no mistake. America remains engaged in the world by history and by choice, shaping a balance of power that favors freedom. We will defend our allies and our interests. We will show purpose without arrogance. We will meet aggression and bad faith with resolve and strength. And to all nations, we will speak for the values that gave our nation birth. America at its best is compassionate. In the quiet of American conscience, we know that deep, persistent poverty is unworthy of our nation's promise. And whatever our views of its cause, we can agree that children at risk are not at fault. Abandonment and abuse are not acts of God. They are failures of love. And the proliferation of prisons, however necessary, is no substitute for hope and order in our souls. Where there is suffering, there is duty. Americans in need are not strangers. They are citizens, not problems, but priorities. And all of us are diminished when any are hopeless. Government has great responsibilities for public safety and public health, for civil rights and common schools. Yet compassion is the work of a nation, not just a government. And some needs and hurts are so deep, they will only respond to a mentor's touch or a pastor's prayer. Church and charity, synagogue and mosque lend our communities their humanity, and they will have an honored place in our plans and in our laws. Many in our country do not know the pain of poverty, but we can listen to those who do. And I can pledge our nation to a goal. When we see that wounded traveler on the road to Jericho, we will not pass to the other side. George W. Bush Inaugural Address America at its best is a place where personal responsibility is valued and expected. Encouraging responsibility is not a search for scapegoats. It is a call to conscience. And though it requires sacrifice, it brings a deeper fulfillment. We find the fullness of life not only in options but in commitments. And we find that children and community are the commitments that set us free. Our public interest depends on private character, on civic duty and family bonds and basic fairness, on uncounted, unhonored acts of decency which give direction to our freedom. Sometimes in life we are called to do great things, but as a saint of our times has said, every day we are called to do small things with great love. The most important tasks of a democracy are done by everyone. I will live and lead by these principles, to advance my convictions with civility, to pursue the public interest with courage, to speak for greater justice and compassion, to call for responsibility, and try to live it as well. In all these ways, I will bring the values of our history to the care of our times. What you do is as important as anything government does. I ask you to seek a common good beyond your comfort to defend needed reforms against easy attacks, to serve your nation beginning with your neighbor. I ask you to be citizens, citizens, not spectators, citizens, not subjects, responsible citizens, building communities of service and a nation of character. Americans are generous and strong and decent, not because we believe in ourselves, but because we hold beliefs beyond ourselves. When this spirit of citizenship is missing, no government program can replace it. When this spirit is present, no wrong can stand against it. After the Declaration of Independence was signed, Virginia statesman John Page wrote to Thomas Jefferson, 
We know the race is not to the swift nor the battle to the strong. Do you not think an angel rides in the whirlwind and directs this storm? Much time has passed since Jefferson arrived for his inauguration. The years and changes accumulate. But the themes of this day he would know. Our nation's grand story of courage and its simple dream of dignity. We are not this story's author, who fills time and eternity with his purpose. Yet his purpose is achieved in our duty, and our duty is fulfilled in service to one another. Never tiring, never yielding, never finishing, we renew that purpose today, to make our country more just and generous, to affirm the dignity of our lives and every life. This work continues, this story goes on, and an angel still rides in the whirlwind and directs this storm. God bless you all, and God bless America. Takako Doi The underpinnings of our lives is hope. If we have the smallest margin of hope, we can continue to exist. I believe what is sought from politics is to expand that hope even by the smallest margin. When we think of it, however, it seems politics has cast a shadow over people's hopes. I cannot ask help, but ask myself if there has ever been so much urgency embodied in the words, future of hope. However, even knowing the absolute destructive capacity of nuclear weapons, and having experienced its atrocity, mankind still has not been able to walk the road to the destruction of nuclear arms. To the contrary, some countries see the retention of nuclear arms as the symbol of a national power. In the 21st century, we are going to gain richness with science and technology. Or will humanity be subjugated to science and technology? we will be faced with the choice of one or the other. I believe the advances of telecommunication technology will present us with similar choices in the future. Fifty years after the war, the Japanese society is caught in a very perplexing stagnation. When I look back on the last fifty years of Japanese history, I am beset by the deepest soul-searching and painful frustration when I find that we Japanese have not been able to overcome our mistakes on our own volition. We still have not been able to reach a reconciliation with many of our Asian friends. Politicians should speak of the future, of ethics, and life. A discussion of hope should be based on fundamental principles. In particular, politicians must speak with children and young people and women if we are to retain hope for the future. Politicians must be accountable for their decisions, and they must also question the criteria in which their responsibility would be assessed. That is, why our enlightened forebearers and predecessors who have translated ideals into reality continue to be respected and be a source of encouragement. Immanuel Kant wrote, Truly lasting peace is not an empty ideal, but a challenge given to us. This challenge will be solved gradually and we will eventually reach our goal. We must all share a firm resolve to realize our goals. The critical stimulus for that will be the recognition of human rights and coexistence. However, there are many problems that face us, but when we think of how we can respond to such difficulties and challenges, I question where we can place our starting point. It is at this fundamental question that the future of hope must be questioned. That is the question I entertain for myself, and which I believe has to be resolved. Naomi Wolf, A Woman's Place Even the best of revolutions can go awry when we internalize the attitudes we are fighting. The class of 1992 is graduating into a violent backlash against the advances women have made over the last 20 years. This backlash ranges from a senator using the exorcist against Anita Hill to beer commercials with the Swedish bikini team. Today, I want to give you a backlash survival kit, a four-step manual to keep the dragons from taking up residence inside your own heads. My own commencement at Yale eight years ago was the graduation from hell. The speaker was Dick Cavett, rumored to have been our president's brother in an all-male secret society. Mr. Cavett took the microphone and paled at the sight of hundreds of female about-to-be Yale graduates. When I was a graduate, I recall he said, 
there were no women. The women went to Vassar. At Vassar, they had nude photographs taken of the women in gym class to check their posture. One year, the photos were stolen and turned up for sale in New Haven's red light district. His punchline? The photos found no buyers. I'll never forget that moment. There we were, silent in our black gowns, our tassels, our brand new shoes. We dared not break the silence with hisses or boos out of respect for our families, who'd come so far. And they kept still out of concern for us. Consciously or not, Mr. Cabot was using the beauty myth aspect of the backlash. When women come too close to masculine power, someone will draw critical attention to their bodies. We might be Elis, but we still wouldn't make pornography worth buying. That afternoon, several hundred men were confirmed in the power of a powerful institution. But many of the women felt the shame of the powerless, the choking on silence, the complicity, the helplessness. We were orphaned from the institution. I want to give you the commencement talk that was denied to me. Message number one in your survival kit. Redefine becoming a woman. Today, you have become women. But that sounds odd in ordinary usage. What is usually meant by, you're a real woman now, you become a woman when you menstruate for the first time, or when you lose your virginity, or when you have a child. These biological definitions are very different from how we say boys become men. One becomes a man when he undertakes responsibility or completes a quest. But you too, in some ways more than your male friends graduating today, have moved into maturity through a solidarity quest for the adult self. Naomi Wolf, A Woman's Place We lack archetypes for the questing young woman, her trials by fire, for how one becomes a woman through the chrysalis of education, the difficult passage from one book, one idea to the next. Let's refuse to have our scholarship and our gender pitted against each other. In our definition, the scholar learns womanhood and the woman learns scholarship. Plato and Ajuna Barnes mediated to their own enrichment through the eyes of the female body with its wisdoms and its gifts. I say that you have already shown courage. Many of you graduate today in spite of the post-traumatic syndrome of acquaintance rape, which one-fourth of female students undergo. Many of you were so weakened by anorexia and bulimia that it took every ounce of your will to get your work in. You negotiated private lives through a minefield of new strains of VD and the ascending shadow of AIDS. Triumphant survivors, you have already become women. Message number two breaks the ultimate taboo for women. Ask for money in your lives. Expect it. Own it. Learn to use it. Little girls learn a debilitating fear of money, that it's not feminine to ensure we are fairly paid for honest work. Meanwhile, women make 68 cents for every male dollar, and half of marriages end in divorce, after which women's income drops precipitously. Never choose a profession for material reasons. But whatever field your heart decides on, for God's sake, get the most specialized training in it you can, and hold out hard for just compensation, parental leave, and child care. Resist your assignment to the class of highly competent, grossly underpaid women who run the show, while others get the case and the credit. Claim money, not out of greed, but so you can tithe to women's political organizations, shelters, and educational institutions. Sexist institutions won't yield power if they're just patient long enough. The only language the status quo understands is money, votes, and public embarrassment. When you have equity, you have influence. As sponsors, shareholders, and alumni, use it to open opportunities to women who deserve the chances you've had. Your BA does not belong to you alone, just as the earth does not belong to its present tenants alone. Your education was lent to you by women of the past, and you will give some back to living women and to your daughters seven generations from now. Message number three, never cook for or sleep with anyone who routinely puts you down. Message number four, become goddesses of disobedience. Virginia Woolf once wrote that we must slay the angel in the house, the censor within. Young women, tell me of injustices, from campus rape cover-ups to classroom sexism. 
but at the thought of confrontation, they freeze into niceness. We are told that the worst thing we can do is cause conflict, even in the service of doing right. Antigone is imprisoned. Joan of Arc burns at the stake, and someone might call us unfeminine. Naomi Wolf, A Woman's Place When I wrote a book that caused controversy, I saw how big a dragon was this paralysis by niceness. The beauty myth argues that newly rigid ideals of beauty are instruments of a backlash against feminism, designed to lower women's self-esteem for a political purpose. Many positive changes followed the debate, but all that would dwindle away when someone yelled at me, as, for instance, cosmetic surgeons did on TV, when I raised questions about silicone implants. Oh, no, I'd quail. People are mad at me. Then I read something by poet Audre Lorde. She'd been diagnosed with breast cancer. I was going to die, she wrote, sooner or later, whether or not I had even spoken myself. My silences had not protected me. Your silences will not protect you. What are the words you do not have yet? What are the tyrannies you swallow day by day and attempt to make your own until you will sicken and die of them, still in silence? We've been socialized to respect fear more than our own need for language. I began to ask each time, what's the worst that could happen to me if I tell this truth? Unlike women in other countries, our breaking silence is unlikely to have us jailed, disappeared, or run off the road at night. Our speaking out will irritate some people, get us called bitchy or hypersensitive, and disrupt some dinner parties. And then our speaking out will permit other women to speak until laws are changed and lives are saved and the world is altered forever. Next time, ask what's the worst that will happen? Then push yourself a little further than you dare. Once you start to speak, people will yell at you, and they will interrupt you, put you down, and suggest it's personal. And the world won't end. And the speaking will get easier and easier, and you will find you have fallen in love with your own vision, which you may never have realized you had. And you will lose some friends and lovers and realize you don't miss them. And new ones will find you and cherish you. And you will still flirt and paint your nails and dress up and party because, as I think Emma Goldman said, if I can't dance, I don't want to be part of your revolution. And at last, you'll know with surpassing certainty that only one thing is more frightening than speaking your truth. And that is not speaking. Diana, Princess of Wales Ladies and gentlemen, I must begin by saying how warmly I welcome this conference on landmines convened by the Mines Advisory Group and the Landmine Survivors Network. It is so welcome because the world is too little aware of the waste of life, limb, and land which anti-personnel landmines are causing among some of the poorest people on Earth. Indeed, until my journey to Angola early this year, on which I'm going to speak this morning, I was largely unaware of it too. For the mine is a stealthy killer. Long after conflict is ended, its innocent victims die or are wounded singly in countries of which we hear little. Their lonely fate is never reported. The world, with its many other preoccupations, remains largely unmoved by a death roll of something like 800 people every month many of them women and children. Those who are not killed outright, and they number another 1,200 a month, suffer terrible injuries and are handicapped for life. I was in Angola in January with the British Red Cross, a country where there are 15 million landmines in a population, ladies and gentlemen, of 10 million, with the desire of drawing world attention to this vital but hitherto largely neglected issue. Some people chose to interpret my visit as a political statement. But it was not. I am not a political figure. As I said at the time, and I'd like to reiterate now, my interests are humanitarian. That's why I felt drawn to this human tragedy. This is why I wanted to play down my part in working towards a worldwide ban on these weapons. During my days in Angola, I saw at first hand three aspects of this scourge in the hospitals of Luanda, the capital, and Huambo, scene of bitter fighting not long ago. 
I visited some of the mine victims who had survived and saw their injuries. I'm not going to describe them because, in my experience, it turns too many people away from the subject. Suffice to say that when you look at the mangled bodies, some of them children caught by these mines, you marvel at their survival. What is so cruel about these injuries is that they are mostly invariably suffered where medical resources are scarce. I observed for myself some of the obstacles to improving medical care in most of these hospitals. Often, there's a chronic shortage of medicine, of painkillers, even of anesthetics. Surgeons constantly engaged in amputating shattered limbs never have all the facilities we would expect to see here. So the human pain that is to be borne is often beyond imagining. This emergency medical care, moreover, is only the first step back to a sort of life. For those whose living is the land, loss of an arm or leg is an overwhelming handicap which lasts for life. I saw the fine work being done by the Red Cross and other agencies to replace lost limbs, but making prosthesis is a costly as well as complicated business. For example, a young child will need several different fittings as it grows older. Sometimes the severity of the injury makes the fitting of an artificial limb impossible. There are never enough resources to replace all the limbs that are lost. Diana, Princess of Wales. As the Red Cross have expressed it, each victim who survives will incur lifetime expenses for surgery and prosthetic care totaling between two thousand and three thousand. That is an intolerable load for a handicapped person in a poor country. That is something to which the world should urgently turn its conscience. In Angola, one in every three hundred thirty-four members of the population is an amputee. Angola has the highest rate of amputees in the world. How can countries which manufacture and trade in these weapons square their conscience with such human devastation? My third main experience was to see what has been done slowly and perilously to get these mines out of the earth. In the Kuwaitu and Huambo region, I spent a morning with a small team from Halo Trust, which is training Angolans to work on the pervasive minefields and supervising their work. I speak of our team because men of the mines advisory group, or in this instance the Halo Trust, who volunteer for this hazardous work, are usually former members of our own services. I take this opportunity to pay my tribute to the work these men do on our behalf. The perils they encounter are not just confined to mines. Two members of the mines advisory group team in Cambodia, Chris Howes and Hun Horth, were kidnapped by the Khmer Rouge a year ago, and their fate is uncertain. We can only pray for their safe return. Much ingenuity has gone into making some of these mines. Many are designed to trap an unwary D miner. Whenever such tricky mines appear, the D miner will call in one of the supervising team, who will then take over. That is what keeps their lives perpetually at risk. It might be less hazardous, I reflect, after my visit to Angola, if some of the technical skills used in making mines had been applied to better methods of removing them. Many of these mines are relatively cheap; they can be bought for five apiece or less. Tracing them, lifting them. And disposing of them costs far more, sometimes as much as a hundred times more. Angola is full of refugees returning after a long war. They present another aspect of this tragedy: the refugee turns towards home, often ignorant of conditions in his homeland. He knows of mines, but homeward bound, eagerness to complete the journey gets the better of him, or he finds mines on what was once his land and attempts to clear them. There were many examples of that in Angola. These mines inflict most of their casualties on the people who are trying to meet the elementary needs of life. They strike the wife or the grandmother gathering firewood for cooking. They ambush the child sent to collect water for the family. I was impressed to see the work being done by many of the world's agencies on mine awareness. If children can be taught at school, if adults can be helped to learn what to do. And what not to do in regions that have been mined, then lives can be saved and injuries reduced. Diana, Princess of Wales. There are said to be around 110 million mines lurking somewhere in the world, and over a third of them are to be found in Africa. 
Angola is probably more heavily mined than anywhere else because the war went on for such a long time, and it invaded so much of the country. So that country is going to be infested with mines and will suffer many more victims. And this brings me to one of the main conclusions I reached after this experience. Even if the world decided tomorrow to ban these weapons, this terrible legacy of mines already in the earth would continue to plague the poor nations of the globe. The evil that men do lives after them, and so it seems to me there rests a certain obligation upon the rest of us. One of my objectives in visiting Angola was to forward the cause of those like the Red Cross, striving in the name of humanity to secure an international ban on these weapons. Since then, we are glad to see some real progress has been made. There are signs of a change of heart, at least in some parts of the world. For that, we should be cautiously grateful. If an international ban on landmines can be secured, it means, looking far ahead, that the world may be a safer place for this generation's grandchildren. But for this generation, in much of the developing world, there will be no relief, no relaxation. The toll of deaths and injuries caused by mines already there will continue. This tracing and lifting of mines, as I saw in Angola, is a desperately slow business. So, in my mind, a central question remains: Should we not do more to quicken the deminers' work, to help the injured back to some sort of life, to further our own contribution to aid and development? The country is enriched by the work done by its overseas agencies and non-governmental organizations who work to help people in Africa and Asia to improve the quality of their lives. Yet mines cast a constant shadow over so much of this work. Resettlement of refugees is made more hazardous. Good land is put out of bounds. Recovery from war is delayed. Aid workers themselves are put at risk. I would like to see more done for those living in this no man's land, which lies between the wrongs of yesterday and the urgent needs of today. I think we owe it. I also think it would be of benefit to us as well as to them. The more expeditiously we can end this plague on earth caused by the landmine, the more readily we can set about the constructive tasks to which so many give their hand in the cause of humanity.